Introduction I was always too scared to visit Egypt. In 2001, I wasted 5,000 New Zealand dollars worth of flights and a tour booked to sail the Nile, by not getting on the plane. Yes, it was September 11th. I was working in London, and just went straight home to New Zealand. Because of sporadic but widely reported acts of terrorism and political violence, the numbers of people visiting Egypt to take in its marvels fluctuates wildly. The country had 14.7 million visitors in 2010, but only 5.4 million in 2016. Quite a few of the guides I spoke to during my stay hadn't had much work for years. Concern about terrorism tends to be out of all proportion to the actual levels of risk for the average traveler. According to a recent article, there are at least 3 million Americans abroad on any given day, yet in the whole of 2018 only six were killed by terrorists. Just in the last few years, the Egyptian tourism industry has bounced back. And in 2018 one of the visitors willing to brave the country was me. I'm glad I did. In fact, I would go so far as to say that as one of the original cradles of civilization, Egypt is a must for the serious traveler. The Nile Valley and the Nile Delta, where nearly all Egyptians live, remains full of the relics of the ancient Egyptian civilization that began more than 4,000 years ago. At over a million square kilometers, Egypt is nearly five times the size of Great Britain. However, almost all of Egypt is desert apart from a comparatively small part kept green by the waters of the Nile. It's in this small area, less than a tenth of the total, that nearly all of Egypt's 98 million people live. More than 20 million live in Greater Cairo, the largest city in Africa, the Middle East and the Arab world. More than 5 million also live in Alexandria, a city founded by the ancient Greeks which was for a long time the second most important city in the Roman Empire. Cairo, it occupies a spot that was always important, where the delta joins the Nile Valley. Most of the famous pyramids are in the suburbs of Cairo, and one of the several ancient Egyptian capitals, Memphis, after which Memphis, Tennessee is named, was also in this area. At the southern end of the country, the Aswan High Dam impounds the Nile for hundreds of kilometers in Lake Nasser, which extends across the border into Sudan. There are three main tourist areas in Egypt. First, the Nile Valley, and Delta, down to Lake Nasser in the south. Here, the main attraction is the great abundance of ancient Egyptian antiquities, as this part of the country was the heartland of the ancient Egyptian civilization. The Egyptian Museum in Cairo and the pyramids on the city's outskirts are the essential starting point for any tour based on ancient Egypt. Second, the Sinai Peninsula. Or more precisely, the seaside resorts at its southern tip, places like Dahab, Sharm el-Sheikh and El Tor. The resorts are especially famous for their diving opportunities, as the waters of the Red Sea receive little in the way of inflows from rivers and are therefore really clear, like the waters of an atoll in the middle of a tropical sea, and for the same reason. Third, the Western Desert. A series of oases linked by road make the Western Desert fairly navigable. It's common to do a loop trip from Cairo around the Haja, Dakla, Farafra and Bahari oases, taking in the incredible landforms of the calcium-rich White Desert and the Mordor-like Black Desert plus Wadi Hattan, also known as Wadi El Hattan or Wadi El Hattan, the Valley of the Whales. The Valley of the Whales is a dried-up seabed littered with fossilized whale skeletons. It's in Lent today, but millions of years ago it was on the coast. I arrived in Egypt in September 2018. One traveler had told me I should stay at the Australian hostel in Cairo. Another told me that the Red Sea resorts on the Sinai were a must-do. So I did tours based on the Nile and took myself by bus to the Sinai Red Sea port of Dahab, leaving the Western Desert for a later trip. This book is about my experiences in the Nile and Sinai. If I make it to the Western Desert, I'll write about that in detail on my blog, which you can read for free. Chapter 1 Travel Tips, and Where I Went I always get a local SIM card to avoid roaming charges, and that's the first tip I would give you. You should make sure that you get all recommended travel insurance and vaccinations and follow all recommended health advisories. A traveler's first aid kit, including antiseptics and anti-diarrhea medicine, is a good idea. Follow any advisories issued by your government and other authorities about episodes of unrest and terrorism. However, don't let that put you off traveling to countries like Egypt. The local traffic is more dangerous. The local traffic is, indeed, dangerous. The water is often unsound to drink, and the food often unsound to eat. You need to take precautions. 
Dress codes are not strict, but short sleeves and bare arms are generally to be avoided. Hire reputable guides. Book them in advance. Use a secure courier for valuables. When you visit the pyramids at Giza and Saqqara, tickets are issued that give widespread free access. Hawkers will try to sell you additional tickets, so be warned. This is not a travel guide, these are just my tips. My itinerary. Day 1, 3 Sept 2018, arrive in Cairo Day 2, visit Giza and Saqqara Pyramids Day 3, free day in Cairo. Travel to Aswan by overnight train Day 4, Aswan, visit Philae Temple. The High Dam and the Unfinished Obelisk Day 5, Nile Cruise, departing from Aswan. Day 6, Nile Cruise. Comombo and Edfu Day 7, Nile Cruise, arriving in Luxor. Visit Luxor Temple and Karnak Temple. Day 8, Luxor West Bank, Valley of the Kings, Colossi of Memnon and the Funerary Temple of Hatshepsut. Train back to Cairo. Day 9, Cairo. Tour of the Egyptian Museum, the Coptic Area and the Cairo Citadel Day 10. Cairo and Alexandria Day 11, Alexandria Day 12, Return to Cairo Day 13, Bus to Dahab Day 14, Dahab Day 15, Dahab, and back to Cairo. Chapter 2 Where History Began The history of Egypt begins several thousand years ago, when, just after the end of the Ice Age, most of the Sahara was quite green, as was Arabia. At that time, the area was nourished by monsoon rains, like India. However, these monsoons mostly ceased about 6,000 years ago, apart from the ones that still nourish India. Now that the seasonal rains no longer came, the climate changed to a desert climate. Huge lakes dried up into small oases. Most of the inhabitants of the growing deserts were forced to leave. Some say this is the origin of the legend of the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. The lands of the future Egypt were no exception. Their inhabitants took refuge in the Nile Valley and Delta, which remained green. There, they began to build a civilization based on the worship of the life-preserving river and on the idea that the now-burning deserts to the east, and to the west, had got that way because they were too close to where the sun rose and set. And so, arose the civilization of ancient Egypt, one of the world's oldest, dating back in a recognizable way to 3200 BCE under a ruler named Nama. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus famously wrote that Egypt was the gift of the Nile. It is only because the Nile exists, that a large population and an ancient civilization have been possible in Egypt. Though ancient Egypt controlled outlying territories such as much of modern Israel for long periods, the heart of their civilization was the Nile Valley and the Delta of the Nile, on the Mediterranean Sea. The rulers of ancient Egypt came to be known as pharaohs. They were mostly indigenous, but in the last few hundred years BCE, ancient Egypt was taken over by Greek rulers. The Greek pharaohs were known as the Ptolemies, the male ones often chose the regal name of Ptolemy. There were also many female rulers, who just as often chose the name Cleopatra. The famously sexy Cleopatra we've all heard of was actually Cleopatra VII. By this stage the culture of Egypt was totally hybridized. As its name suggests, the city of Alexandria was founded by Alexander the Great. The majority of its inhabitants were Greeks. Meanwhile, ethnic Egyptians continued to inhabit the Nile Valley. Increasingly, they were becoming the country folk of a colonized society. So, on one monument at the Dendera or Dendera Temple Complex, across the Nile from Quena, a city hundreds of kilometers up the Nile, Cleopatra and her son Caesarion are represented in the old style, complete with the hieroglyphic writing system developed in the early days of Egyptian civilization, around 2800 BCE. Meanwhile, among people nearer the coast who thought of themselves as Greek or Roman by this stage, Cleopatra was represented in their style. Although the Ptolemaic stage was the last stage of ancient Egyptian civilization before it fizzled out, more on this below, many of the most famous temple complexes that tourists visit today were built in that era. Along with Dendera, these include Esna, Edfu, Komombo, and Philae. I visited the last three in the course of my travels in Egypt. In Roman times, which came after the time of the Ptolemies, Egypt was a province, but an important one. Roman control extended as far as the Red Sea port of Berenice Troglodyta. It's still there, just north of the modern border with Sudan, and still with the same name. It means Berenice of the Cave Dwellers, though nobody now knows who the Cave Dwellers were or if they even existed. The eastern part of the Roman Empire was run in a day-to-day -day sense by the Greeks. So, 
Even after the demise of the Ptolemies, Egypt remained under a Greek influence. The Greek influence on Egypt included a gradual penetration by the Christian religion, which was mostly spread by Greeks in those days even if its originators had been Jewish or Palestinian. As for the spoken language of ancient Egypt, it absorbed many Greek words and was transformed by stages into a language known as Coptic, which is almost extinct as a spoken language today but still widely used by Egypt's Christian minority for church services. Bible scholars had long had a fair idea of what the ancient Egyptian spoken language must have been like. Straining the Greek words out of Coptic left a residue of ancient Egyptian, more or less. But for more than a thousand years, until the 1800s, no living person had been able to read Egypt's temple hieroglyphics. A Greek term meaning priestly writing, the hieroglyphic system predated any known alphabet, an idea that doesn't seem to have occurred to anyone at first. Lacking even the concept of an alphabet, the originators of the hieroglyphic system had employed about a thousand characters resembling pictures of birds, plants, and other objects, which were arranged and rearranged in all kinds of different and rather ad hoc ways to convey meaning. In many cases, the picture referred directly to the thing represented, like drawing a picture of a bird to represent a bird, or squiggly lines to represent water. In other cases, the picture conveyed a sound associated with the thing in the picture. This was like drawing a picture of a bird to represent the letter B in English, or squiggly, watery lines for W. All that was obvious enough, in some cases. The trouble was that there was an added layer of complexity. For, along with simple pictures and sounds associated with those pictures, certain arrangements of the rather limited character set also conveyed more abstract ideas. In this sense, hieroglyphics had a lot in common with early Chinese. In the early history of China, at around the same time as ancient Egypt, the writing system also had a hieroglyphic character. The more complicated ideas were expressed by square and boxy-looking arrangements of concrete picture images that, as a group, signified something more abstract. Over time the pictures and arrangements of pictures gave way to arrangements of brush strokes. But a picture, or an arrangement of pictures, was how the average Chinese character actually first took shape. The meaning of even the most complicated Chinese characters has been handed down to the present day. But in the face of hieroglyphs, modern people were confronted by a writing system of similar complexity to Chinese, whose meaning was now lost save for the most simple and obvious picture elements. As in China, the writing system was used by a priestly or mandarin class to administer a vast empire in which the spoken language differed from place to place. The reason the knowledge of hieroglyphics was subsequently lost was that the civilization of ancient Egypt gradually collapsed, whereas China did not. The ancient Egyptian civilization lasted for more than 3,000 years and reconstituted itself several times. Thus, historians speak of the Old Kingdom, the comparatively short-lived Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom. The Old Kingdom invented hieroglyphics and built the pyramids, the New Kingdom came up with the title of Pharaoh and developed ancient Egypt's artistic skills to their greatest height. The New Kingdom was responsible for most of the look that we associate with ancient Egypt. However, after centuries of Ptolemaic rule at the end of the New Kingdom, ancient Egypt's ruling class culture was entirely absorbed into Roman cum Greek cum Christian civilization, and ancient Egypt ceased to exist. And so, the hieroglyphic writing system was lost along with the political system that had supported it, to be replaced by the alphabets of the Greeks and Romans. Ironically, these had their origin in ancient Egypt as well. In this part of the world, the first alphabets originated among Egyptian merchants and tradespeople who needed to be able to read and write a bit, but who couldn't read hieroglyphics. Or at least, not very well. Such people only used the simplest hieroglyphic pictures and sound symbols, and they used them alphabetically. Pictures that stood for sounds were soon simplified into abstract symbols, so that they could be written more quickly. Why draw a bird when all you need is a letter? And so, this simple version of hieroglyphics, known as demotic, with a capital D, from the Greek word for ordinary people, became a true alphabet. A nation of seafaring traders called the Phoenicians picked up the alphabet idea and spread it around the Mediterranean. Amazingly, just about every alphabet used in the old world west of India, from English to Arabic, is based on the Egyptian demotic via Phoenicia. Alphabets were invented by ordinary people. But the philosophers and administrators of newer empires, like those of Greece and Rome, were quite happy to use them for even the highest state and religious purposes. And so, 
hieroglyphics became redundant. The meaning of the all the more complicated arrangements of hieroglyphic symbols was entirely forgotten by 500 CE, that is to say AD, or thereabouts. It wasn't just the knowledge of temple hieroglyphs that was lost. Because people couldn't read the hieroglyphics anymore, virtually all detailed knowledge of ancient Egypt was lost at the same time. Another reason that ancient Egypt and its hieroglyphs came to be forgotten was that many of the monuments familiar to us today were actually buried by shifting sands or Nile mud and weren't dug out again until quite recently. Only the most conspicuous monuments such as the pyramids and various colossal statues such as the Colossi of Memnon at Luxor, and the Great Sphinx of Giza, were visible enough to catch the attention of travelers in recent centuries. And even the Great Sphinx was buried up to its neck in the 1700s being progressively uncovered in the 1800s. After many centuries of amnesia, a breakthrough was made in 1799. In that year, a remarkable stone was discovered by French soldiers under the command of Napoleon Bonaparte, at a town in the Nile Delta. The town was called Rashid in Arabic and Trashit in Coptic. The French soldiers thought the town was called Rosette, Little Rose. Others, Italians presumably, called it Rosetta. What came to be known in the West as the Rosetta Stone was remarkable for the following reason, it bore the same message, a decree issued by one of the Ptolemies, in three writing systems. In ancient Greek, which modern scholars could read already. In Demotic Egyptian, soon confirmed to be similar to Coptic, another known language. And in full hieroglyphics. It was only a fragment. But it was enough. Subsequent generations of Egyptologists would go on to decipher all the other hieroglyphic inscriptions in innumerable temples and pyramids, in the same way that the code breakers of Bletchley Park were able to break enemy codes in their entirety, once they had a little bit to go on. After the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, there was a boom in Egyptian exploration. Many things that were thought to have been invented by the Greeks and the Romans turned out to have been known, already, to the Egyptians. Things such as operating tables and complicated medical instruments, for example. Moving on in time, just as it looked as though Egypt was becoming thoroughly Greek and thoroughly Christian as well, the country was conquered by Arab Muslims. Coptic was then replaced by Arabic as the language most often spoken in the streets, and Christianity mostly gave way to Islam. Mostly, but not entirely. There remained substantial Christian communities of Copts and even actual Greeks. For several centuries, from 1517 until 1867, with a brief interlude during which Napoleon's troops were in command, Egypt was also under Ottoman Turkish rule. There's an old Turkish tune called The Red Flag Flies Over Cairo, the red flag being the Turkish one of course. All the same, Egypt was a long way from Istanbul and fairly autonomous for most of the time.